Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Warren Magnuson. I'm from the Political Science Department at UVic, and I'm part of the Urban Studies Committee, which is the organizer of the City Talks series. Um, I assume all of you know where to find out about us, uh, which you just have to Google City Talks uh, Victoria, and you'll find upcoming events. Uh, I'd like to, before I forget, to mention the two uh, remaining upcoming events this term. One is on November 8th, and our speaker will be Professor Michael Cates, or Katz, from the University of Pennsylvania, and the topic is Why Don't American Cities Burn? Uh, if you're puzzled by that topic, the reference is something that older folks like me will remember. Forty-odd years ago, American cities were burning as a result of African-American protests. And the question is, since things have gotten worse since then, why aren't they burning now? So it might be quite pertinent after the results of the American election in November. The second talk is more closely related to our theme uh, for this term, which is to do with the deportation of the Japanese from the west coast of Canada and the US in, uh, during the Second World War. And our featured speaker is Joy Kagawa, uh, who many of you will know as uh, one of Canada's leading novelists. Um, her topic is entitled, My Road to Nagasaki Goes Through Nanking. If you want to come to that lecture, since we're expecting a very large crowd, um, you have to register beforehand. It's still free, uh, but in order to control the numbers, uh, we'd like you to email. So if, if you just go to the City Talks website, you'll know, get the information there about what to do. The third announcement I'd like to, to make is that on um, Saturday, Vincent, who is here, will be leading the second of the city walks. And the city walks are connected to the city talks. We have uh, the text as it were, the talk on the Thursday and on the Saturday. Vincent finds something that connects to the city of Victoria and gives a little walking tour, um, which is a lot of interaction, I think, with the audience. That's from 10 uh, to 12, Saturday morning, meeting at Songhees Point. Um, and the topic is Urban Renewal and the Politics of Exclusion in Victoria. Now, back to tonight's event. It's a really special event for all of us who are connected to the Urban Studies Com Committee because our leader <coughs> is giving a talk. Um, the City Talks are now in their third year. They're the result of some informal discussions that began at UVic between professors in various departments and our, really our co-leaders were Jordan Stanger Ross and Ruben Rose Redwood, who is also here. And uh, Jordan, I think, particularly took the lead in <coughs> devising this whole series at the Legacy Gallery, which belongs to the University of Victoria. The idea is that we wanted to bring the university downtown connect with the city, and have a series of talks on all different subjects that you can imagine connected to the city. We hope these will go on and on and on. We have some funding which lasts for a while. We hope we get a bit more from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Various departments at the University of Victoria have also uh, donated some funding. I guess I would make a little appeal to all of you uh, if you're interested in this talk, first of all, keep up with it, come to the other talks, talk it up amongst your friends, encourage people to, to come, and uh, if you can, encourage anybody who has money uh, <laughs> to give money uh, to the sponsorship of these talks. As I say, Jordan is our speaker tonight. He's an assistant professor in the Department of History. Uh, is a very young fellow by my standards, uh, but already has a very distinguished academic career, uh, noted particularly for um, 
fairly recent book. It's called Staying Italian, Urban Change and Ethnic Life in Post-War Toronto and Philadelphia. Uh, Jordan is particularly interested in questions of race and ethnicity and uh, urban space and so on in, in early 20th century uh, Canada and the United States. He does comparative work. Um, he says his most, uh, the accomplishment of which he is proudest is a recent article called Placing the Poor, the Ecology of Poverty in Post-War Urban Canada. I thought he was proud of it because of the content of it. He said he was particularly proud because he wrote it with his mother. <laughs> I don't know what that's supposed to mean. <laughs> um, his current pro uh, project is called Suspect Properties, Race, Real Estate and Citizenship in Mid-20th Century Canada. And the talk tonight is connected to that. Its subtitle is The Origins of the Decision to Liquidate Japanese Canadian Real Estate in World War II. Please join me in welcoming Jordan Stamos. Why you wander sure away with my talk? <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that introduction. And thank you all. It's great to see friendly faces, familiar faces, and unfamiliar ones on a rainy night out here in, uh, in Victoria. Between 1942 and 1945, the Canadian government uprooted over 22,000 Japanese Canadian residents of the British Columbia coast and then liquidated their property, including some 1,700 parcels of real estate. The large majority of those affected by these policies were Canadian citizens, Canadian born and naturalized subjects of Canada. And many saw little or no remuneration from those sales as the funds were held to pay for their sustenance during uh, their uh, period in the BC interior. The sale of Japanese real estate was carried out under the pressure of war, but it also marked the realization of long-standing goals on the part of some in British Columbia to free the province from so-called oriental control operating from an ideological perspective that misconstrued the world as comprised of inalterably distinct and competing racial groups. Some observers celebrated the property sales uh, as a victory for so-called white British Columbia. Many imagined that with the properties in the hands of supposedly more rightful inheritors of the province, Japanese Canadians would never return. The liquidation, of course, as many of you will know, is part of a larger story of internment uh, of some, of the deportation uh, of many, and of the uprooting itself. It offers evidence of the extent of racism in wartime Canada. It was a tragic injustice to Japanese Canadians, and an important catalyst to post-war reconsiderations of Canadian approaches to religious and racial diversity. And yet, the liquidation has never been adequately explained. The sale of Japanese Canadian property was not the result of wartime anxiety. It was not the result of concerns about a Japanese fifth column in Canada. It was not the result of efforts to protect Japanese Canadians from, uh, from others who might uh, act against them. Security concerns played virtually no role in the liquidation of Japanese Canadian real estate. The property was liquidated after the removal of Japanese Canadians from the coast. The large majority of the property was rented or leased, and more of it could have been at the time of its liquidation. Quite obviously, the property posed no threat either to Japanese Canadians uprooted or to other Canadians still here. The sale of Japanese Canadian property then within this larger story had its own distinctive origin. It was motivated by its own distinctive ideas, and those ideas have been virtually omitted from consideration of this period. Indeed, the first person to suggest the liquidation of Japanese Canadian property in Vancouver, and I'll argue that the arguments in Vancouver were foundational for the larger liquidation, 
The first person to recommend the liquidation of Japanese Canadian property in Vancouver has never before been connected in any fashion with this history. The liquidation has never before been thought of as primarily an urban history, but I'll argue tonight that it was. Ideas about the city played a vital, motivating role in the liquidation policy. Recognition of this part of the story helps to explain the liquidation policy itself, but it also sheds light on the wider operation of racism in state policy during this period. The horrifying career of scientific racism in the 20th century is one of the most important stories of that century. The wartime era has many lessons to impart. Elsewhere, racism reached horrifying heights or depths during the Second World War. And here in Canada, it motivated policies that have been a source of anger and shame since. Within this larger history, the decision to liquidate Japanese Canadian property is its own distinctive chapter with its own distinctive lessons to impart. I'll argue that. It was a policy that drew upon a complicated and synthetic logic. That it was a policy that did not lean explicitly upon race hatred. That it was a policy that could dispossess Japanese Canadians even as it acknowledged their Canadian citizenship. And it's critical, I think, that we come to grips with this kind of state racism. Angry, explicit race hatred faded from public acceptability in the post-war period. But arguably, at least, the kind of racism represented in the liquidation policy cast a longer post-war shadow. A full understanding of how the policy worked, then, is critical to our assessments of race and racism in mid-century Canada. Japanese Canadians lost their homes and businesses because conceptions of racial difference were drawn together with ideas about urban life and property. This synthesis of ideas about people and ideas about the city enabled a re-characterization of Japanese Canadian real estate as a perishable good. And this is the crux of my argument a re-characterization of Japanese-Canadian real estate as a perishable good. And it was this ill-founded re-characterization that motivated the liquidation policy, that propelled it forward. Racism worked to dispossess Japanese-Canadians because of its intersection with ideas about how people lived in cities, how they socialized in neighborhoods, and how they used property. The historic center of Japanese Canadian settlement and Japanese immigrant settlement that we heard about in the last lecture last month, the area in the east end uh, of Vancouver, that Powell Street neighborhood, known at the time uh, among many as Japantown, Nihonmaki to its residents, played a surprising role in this process. And I'll detail that role uh, in this talk. To grasp this history, we have to begin by understanding that the liquidation represented policy change. The removal of Japanese Canadian residents from the coast of British Columbia was not assumed from the outset to include the liquidation of their assets. In February of 1942, Order and Council 1486 authorized the mass removal of people of the Japanese race in the language of that Order and Council. Uh, um, which is issued by cabinet, by Canadian cabinet, right? Um, authorized the mass removal of people of the Japanese race in the language of that order and council from the coast of British Columbia. But it said virtually nothing about the handling of their property. Two orders and council followed in March that offered some indication of the government's direction on, in this policy area. And uh, those orders and council were vague. They indicated that the uh, property would be dealt with in such a way as the government saw fit, uh, a provision that was of much concern to Japanese Canadian property owners, many of whom uh, resisted registering their property with the Canadian government on that basis. But to the extent that it said something more concrete than that, the policy indicated that the custodianship of Japanese Canadian property would be administered in the interests of those owners, in the interests of Japanese Canadian owners. 
that the property would be protected and preserved, that it would be held in trusteeship. Bureaucrats were dispatched from Ottawa, uh, working within an office of government called the Custodian of Enemy Property that had been established in, during the First World War to administer these, uh, these properties. And they struggled from the outset with the task before them. They were handling many more properties than they ever had before. They had this new mandate to protect and preserve the property of Canadian citizens. And so they struggled with that task and they sought from a very early juncture in the war to change the policy toward a policy of liquidation. But until policy actually changed some 11 months later with a new order in council authorizing the liquidation, until policy actually changed, they read their directives carefully, they took it as their mandate to protect and preserve Japanese Canadian property, and they administered it um, without, without liquidation. On January 11, 1943, almost a year after that initial order to uproot the Japanese Canadian population, cabinet ministers sat for a meeting that would end with a draft of the liquidation order. The first thing that they discussed that day were urban properties, the properties in the city of Vancouver. And so it was throughout the policy discussions that led to liquidation, the first and often foremost, the most extensive area of discussion were urban properties with an emphasis on the problematic properties from the view of the custodian uh, in Vancouver's East End and the Powell Street neighborhood. The shift from protecting and preserving, though, to a policy of liquidation was gradual, and understanding this shift is essential to understanding the liquidation policy itself. We can begin to get a sense of this shift in a meeting that occurred in December 1942. So it's been some time since the uprooting. This is just a month before that order that would liquidate the properties. And between the spring, really, and the fall of 1942, the Japanese Canadian population has been uprooted from the coast, and its property vested in or given over to the administrative authority of this office, the custodian of enemy property, which, off, which operated under the direction of the Secretary of State, then Norman McClarty. In December 1942, when officials of the custodian came to that meeting, they were still operating with this mandate to protect and preserve Japanese Canadian real estate. And so in this context, they met with representatives of a special committee of the municipal government of Vancouver to discuss the question of Japanese properties. That special committee from the city was comprised of an alderman Buscombe, who was a city councillor, and a representative on the Town Planning Commission of the city, and uh, by that time was sort of the leading figure in anti-Japanese rhetoric coming out of the city uh, by that time. And he was joined in that meeting by officials within various municipal departments, including building and health. Buscombe began the meeting by addressing himself to a G.W. McPherson, who was a bureaucrat from Ottawa who had been sent to Vancouver administered the custodian's office in Vancouver until the liquidation policy became official. So he addresses himself to McPherson, and he starts talking about the Powell Street neighborhood. Buscombe claimed, along with the support of the uh, other uh, uh, municipal officials there, that the area was unfit for what they called human habitation. And they were worried that the custodian of enemy property was already renting these unfit dwellings to white tenants who uh, were arriving to the city uh, to work. And so the city councillor, Buscombe, and with the support of these municipal departments, suggested liquidation. They pointed to the fact that the federal government had already liquidated almost 1,500 fishing vessels from the coast, Japanese Canadian owned fishing vessels. And he said, well, why not follow that precedent? Liquidate the fishing vessels, now let's liquidate the real estate. In McPherson, in McPherson, in response, McPherson laid out two principles that until that date at least, and for a short time thereafter, protected Japanese Canadian real estate on the coast. And I'll quote the minutes of that meeting, which were recorded by someone in the custodian's, um, custodian's office and take that, that position. So he's quoting McPherson's response to Buscombe asking, why don't we just follow the precedent set by fishing vessel? McPherson stated, that this question involved a major policy with regards to the vessels, the fishing vessels, 
These were sold because they would quickly deteriorate. And that other items had been sold of a perishable nature, such as grocery stock, etc. McPherson stated that an amount of enemy property was being sold, enemy property was being sold, but that it was not our policy to force liquidation with regard to the evacuee owned property. Not their policy to force liquidation with regard to evacuee owned property. McPherson's making two separate distinctions here, and both are worth noting. The first distinguishes categories of property, perishable from non-perishable, grocery stock from things like real estate, which tend to retain value over time. And the second is distinction between categories of people, enemies on the one hand, whose property is apparently being liquidated in December 1942, and evacuees on the other. Fishing vessels, McPherson was arguing, were actually perishable, subject to rapid deterioration if not expertly maintained. And in fact, the uh, uh, custodian had, had 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 difficulty, the, the government really had had difficulty holding all of the fishing vessels that it had seized. Real property in Vancouver, on the other hand, was officially non-perishable in December of 1942, at least when the custodian was speaking on the record to city officials. It tended not to lose its value over time, it retained value, even accrued value over time. This distinction, as I've already suggested, crumbled in the month that followed, and even as McPherson made the distinction about property in his meeting, he was already actively seeking to undermine it in memos that he was sending to his superiors within the office of the custodian. But at least in his meeting with city officials, in his official, uh, in his official statements of policy, and in his administration of the property to that date, um, this distinction had been maintained. Real estate would ultimately be liquidated because it was recharacterized as perishable. That it came to be seen, or at least to be rationalized, as being like grocery stock, fishing vessels, and so on. And I'll return to that recharacterization. But before that, I want to consider the second distinction in McPherson's response to Buscombe. And I'll re just return to those minutes to remind you of them. McPherson stated that an amount of enemy property was being sold, but it was not our policy to force liquidation with regard to evacuee-owned property. This is a distinction between categories of people. From the start of the uprooting, the custodian of enemy property had been clear about a distinction between enemies and evacuees, even though newspapers and municipal politicians and even federal politicians tended to confuse the distinction in their public statements. But for the custodian of enemy property, the entity that really moved forward the liquidation policy ultimately, enemy was a narrowly defined category, including only individuals actually residing in Japan or in Japanese-owned, uh, Japanese-occupied territory, as well as those who had been detained under the Defense of Canada regulations, the internees. In January 1944, to give you a sense of the numbers, in January 1944, the custodian's office in Vancouver reported having files on 1,400 individuals, 1,418 individuals actually, who held property that was considered property of enemy uh, aliens. By contrast, so that's 1,418. By contrast, the office had, had 15,500 files pertaining to the property of evacuees. So the vast majority of the property fell into this other category, evacuees, that in December, McPherson is suggesting can't yet be liquidated. These were property owners forced away from the coast merely because they were of the Japanese race in the language of that order and council. The majority were, the vast majority, large majority were Canadian born and naturalized subjects. And insofar as the custodian was concerned in the first 11 months, uh, of their, uh, uh, after the uprooting, uh, they couldn't be confused with enemy aliens and their property couldn't be immediately liquidated. The Vancouver office, in accordance with these distinctions, the Vancouver office was set up with two different administrative sections with largely distinct staff that operated in different fashions. The first section was for enemy property, it was 1,400 properties. This section could liquidate the properties vested in them from the outset, 
Expenses generated in the operations of the office, the custodian staff themselves, could be charged against any revenue from the property, rent revenue, or uh, ultimately their liquidation. And the proceeds were not credited to accounts of individual enemies, but rather held in an account by the government pursuant to treaty negotiations after the war. Just imagine that the Japanese government would also have liquidated assets of enemy belligerents, and that these accounts would be brought to bear in diplomatic negotiations after the war. Very distinctive treatment from that of the property of the evacuees. That was dealt with by this second administrative section of the office. Expenses generated by that office by their staff couldn't be charged against the properties. They did charge management fees. They were real estate companies that managed the properties before they were sold, collecting rents, making sure fire insurance was in place, uh, and, and so on, and then ultimately representing the properties on the market. Those were charged against the properties, but the, but the administrative costs of the office itself were by law meant to be uh, um, funded out by the federal budget. Any profit from the properties was accredited to individual accounts. Initially rent revenue, and then subsequently the liquidation was accredited to these individual accounts of individual property owners with the funds to be um, um, given to them. Uh, those who were self-sustaining despite the uprooting got the funds uh, quicker. Those who were in settlement camps, uh, the funds were used, as I've suggested already, to defray the costs of those um, camps. Uh, so certainly there were problematic handling of that of those funds, but a very different handling from the way in which the uh, custodian dealt with enemy property. And crucially for my claims here, at the outset of the war, the evacuee property couldn't be liquidated. These distinctions were never in fact abandoned by the custodian of enemy property. For them, evacuees were always separate from enemy aliens. Japanese Canadians were never reduced to simply Japanese. Indeed, even after the liquidation policy was confirmed, and even as they moved to liquidate the property of evacuees, the custodian continued to stress this distinction between evacuees and enemies, even in the liquidation process. So, in an arrangement that, um, that reflected the peculiar dynamics of the Japanese evacuee case, where they were liquidating the property, of Canadian citizens. The custodian did this liquidation at an arm's length. They established advisory committees, each of which had a Japanese Canadian representative on it. And those advisory committees were to oversee each individual sale of a Japanese owned parcel of real estate. They were also asked at the outset, after the liquidation policy had been permitted by, um, by order and council, in 1943, these advisory committees were asked to indicate whether they thought the liquidation was in fact an advisable um, policy. They had the opportunity to suggest it wasn't. And when McPherson introduced the advisory committee to its tasks, including stressing this fundamental task in writing to them that they should evaluate the liquidation policy itself, when he introduced them to their tasks, he focused in writing on the distinction between enemies and aliens. Uh, enemies rather than evacuees. In writing the chairman of that committee, of Justice uh, Smith of the uh, Provincial Court, he, uh, he, he, he wrote, the question of whether a person is or is not an enemy does not depend on his nationality, but primarily the question of whether or not he is under the control of the enemy, such as residing in enemy territory. In case this divorce between nationality and the legal status of these property owners could still be misunderstood, McPherson provided concrete examples for his reader. It is therefore, he wrote, it is therefore not correct to say that Japanese Canadian subjects residing in Canada who have been evacuated from the protected areas but who have not been interned are enemies. It's kind of a complicated sentence, I'll return over. Yeah. It is not correct to say that Japanese Canadian subjects residing in Canada who have been evacuated from the protected areas, but who have not been interned are enemies. So the vast majority of the Japanese Canadians displaced from the coast are not enemies, he's informing Smith. The vast majority of the property in the custodian's care and all of it that have been um, uh, given over to these advisory committees fell into um, uh, the category of non-enemies, right? 
A contrasting hypothetical drove this point home. It is correct to say, McPherson wrote, it is correct to say that a British subject residing in enemy territory is an enemy. A British subject residing in enemy territory is an enemy. For the custodian, even as they move toward liquidation, for the custodian, race could not formally govern the handling of property. Japanese Canadian holdings could not be liquidated simply because of the origins of their owners. This is not to say that McPherson or others in the custodian office were progressive on racial uh, ideas. There's, in fact, ample um, record to suggest that McPherson himself was actually sort of outlying in his racist um, uh, dispositions, his antipathy towards the Japanese. And so was Buscombe. So all the, both of the parties at that, key parties at that meeting in 1942. But when it came to the liquidation, the custodian did not, the officers within the custodian, key staff figures like McPherson, did not justify the policy on the basis of their antipathy for Japanese Canadians. They felt they couldn't motivate federal policy by stating that Japanese Canadians were unassimilable and therefore their property should be liquidated. Those kinds of statements were coming out of city council uh, during this period. The Japanese are unassimilable, therefore. Uh, but the, for the custodian of enemy property in this particular state act, officials felt they couldn't make that kind of an argument. Instead, liquidation was set in motion by an alternative rationale. This rationale did draw upon notions of racial difference. But it did so in combination with ideas about urban space. And this combination became powerful. It motivated the liquidation of Japanese Canadian property, in ways that their race alone was not deemed to do. To understand that process, we have to return to that uh, first categorical distinction of McPherson's between perishable and non-perishable property, and understand how it is that that distinction crumbled. Ultimately, the property of evacuees was liquidated because their real estate was recharacterized as perishable. And here I'm going to drag you through some further archival details, but you need, to be, um, you need to be taken that way to understand the policy. We need to step, take a step backwards from that meeting in 1942, in December of 1942, between McPherson and Buscombe, before anyone in the custodian's office, at least on the record, started talking about liquidation, a very different group of civil servants was advocating on the record for the liquidation of Japanese Canadian property. The first people to discuss the liquidation of Japanese Canadian property in Vancouver were the members of the Town Planning Commission in that city. The Vancouver City Council had created the Town Planning Commission in 1926, responsible for land use planning and um, enforcement, uh, zoning, and the like. And in the summer of 1942, while the uprooting was still ongoing and incomplete, the Town Planning Commission started advocating liquidation. At the heart of this discussion was a man named Frank E. Buck, past chair of the Town Planning Commission, although not at that time, and a UBC professor specializing in ornamental horticulture. Buck would eventually be heralded as the architect, the landscape architect of the UBC campus, the beautiful University of British Columbia campus, and he's remembered as a leading town planning figure in his day. But he's never before been associated with, and should, in fact, be associated with the liquidation of Japanese Canadian property. In the early 1940s, Buck was immersed in international as well as local conversations among planners about the role of national governments in urban development. In 1940, he had returned from a conference in San Francisco advocating the idea that the city should press the federal government to condemn certain areas central to the city, paving way for major redevelopment projects. Critical here was the imagined involvement of the federal government, which had been involved in various ways in the real estate market, but not in the kinds of direct ways that Buck was fired up about in 1940. People like Buck knew that more intervention from the federal government would be necessary for the fulfillment of their aspirations for the city. And in the summer of 1942, the Planning Commission recalled his excited return in 1940 from San Francisco and resumed discussion of that topic, that perhaps the federal government could become involved in condemning and clearing large sections 
uh, in the inner city of Vancouver. For them, the uprooting of the Japanese Canadian population and the vestiture of their property in the federal government presented an important and unprecedented opportunity. Here was the federal government suddenly vested with real estate in an area ripe in the views of the Town Planning Commission for redevelopment. The Powell Street area caught the attention of planners because of its proximity to downtown and because they already saw it as a slum, a notion that was freighted with racial baggage. They envisioned the area as a perfect area for the development of either modern industry, which was still a development goal of the city at that time, or of workers' housing near the center of the city, proved workers' housing. They were the first to start talking about the substandard nature of the properties of Japanese Canadians who had been uprooted, and the first to start talking about the risks of renting these properties to white tenants in the city. They start passing resolutions, both at the Town Planning Commission level and in their subcommittees, calling upon the city to advocate the clearance of the Powell Street area. And Frank Buck is the first to assemble a team that is capable of pressuring the federal government. And that team is the special committee that met with them in December of 1942. Buck proposed that the city council create a special committee to meet with federal officials. And Buck stipulated that the committee should include a member of city council, George Buscombe, who was on the town planning commission, seemed a, a good candidate, as well as a lawyer, some corporate counsel, the building inspector, the medical health officer, and the city electrician. The composition of the committee proved to be critical. They had tools at their disposal that could be brought to bear on the federal government to impose pressure. By the early fall of 1942, Officials from the custodian's office in Vancouver were reporting pressure from several departments of city government relative to the condition of the properties that the federal government now controlled. The electrical department has, had threatened court action over the rental of uh, units that were substandard on an electrical basis. Anyone who's dealt with city government around these kinds of issues may be familiar with this kind of an approach. The chief sanitary inspector notified the custodian of buildings badly infected with cockroaches. The health department commenced boarding up buildings that it deemed unsuitable for, quote, human habitation. And Mr. Reed of the municipal building department told federal officials, we do not wish to add to your problems and are willing to cooperate, but remember, coroner's juries are embarrassing. If somebody died on a property vested in the custodian and rented to a tenant, the city would have to testify against them. In their Vancouver office, officials of the custodian took such thinly veiled threats seriously, undertaking first to gain more comprehensive knowledge of the properties that had been vested in them. On December, on rather October 15th, 1942, the chief counsel to the custodian's office, a K.W. Wright, joined other staffers on a tour of Japanese properties in uh, Vancouver, Japanese Canadian owned properties. The tour included stops at West Side properties on 4th and 5th Avenues, but it was Powell Street that brought forth the most powerful and telling remarks. In the Powell Street neighborhood, Wright saw evidence of a problem that would ultimately help to steer the government towards a liquidation policy. He wrote in a report afterwards. We have places on Powell Street and in other districts containing as high as 40 to 50 rooms without a bath of any description. The Jap, these are Wright's words, the Jap had three public baths on Powell Street and gathered their families and neighbors together and mixed bathing was the order of the day with no thought of privacy. These places were gossip centers and is, is the answer to the question as to how they lived in congested quarters without thought of the convenience recognized as an absolute necessity by the white man. Here, the intersection of, a, uh, of conceptions of race and urban space came together to start shaping the custodian's policy with regards to these properties. The memo was written in a context where its readers believed in the reality of race. That is, they believed the world was divided into separate and distinct races with different bodily needs and different bodily capacities. These differences could readily be imagined onto urban space. 
Wright and fellow officials could come to an understanding that Japanese Canadians lived under circumstances unsuitable within the Vancouver so-called white mainstream. The particular capacities and diminished needs of Japanese individuals, it was imagined, found expression in city space and in these properties, making the neighborhood unsuitable for so-called white habitation. But here a problem arose. The federal government was suddenly a landlord in this pathologized neighborhood, and flummoxed as to how to make it habitable for white tenants. As the Undersecretary of State to whom McPherson reported, E. H. Coleman would later summarize, so long as the properties were occupied by Japanese, who apparently had adapted themselves to these conditions, sanitary inspections appear to have been infrequent. However, the city intervened in Coleman's view quite rightly when confronted with the prospect of white habitation in the neighborhood. Concerns about the unsuitability of buildings and neighborhoods for human, read white, residents soon became a major policy issue and would ultimately lead to the liquidation of properties well beyond the Powell Street neighborhood. Others, including McPherson and the members of the advisory committee in Vancouver before they made their initial decision on policy, would also take tours of the Powell Street neighborhood, often guided by real estate agents very interested in representing those properties on the market. Officials came away with uniformly dismal views of the neighborhood. McPherson claimed that he had returned to the office a, quote, sadder and wiser man. Whatever the sincerity of this remark, he did return to his office with a clear idea of how to justify the liquidation of Japanese Canadian property. McPherson was a committed racist and a troubled bureaucrat. The custodian's office of which he was the head was overwhelmed with the task before it. Managing the property was difficult and expensive. But once the property had been deemed substandard, the next step for McPherson seems to have been relatively easy. Drawing inspiration from the Town Planning Commission and the special committee that was created by Frank Buck, he began to recharacterize the real estate in the Powell Street area as perishable. He did so in a series of memos that ultimately reached the Secretary of State and members of Cabinet who penned the liquidation order. The argument was relatively straightforward. It hinged on the idea that slums, <coughs> unlike other real estate, tended to depreciate in value over time. It tended to amass debt. It, attended, it tended to crumble into the street. It tended to cause harm to tenants. Uh, it tended to be vandalized by other slum dwellers. Slum housing was like grocery stock. If this premise could be accepted, then it followed that the real estate had to be liquidated. If Japanese Canadian real estate depreciated in value over time, then the federal government, working in the interests of the Japanese Canadian owners themselves, had a fiduciary obligation to liquidate the property. Bureaucrats had to liquidate Japanese Canadian property while it still retained some value. As these arguments filtered up the chain of command from walking tours in the neighborhood to members of cabinet, the arguments relied explicitly on the Canadian citizenship of the Japanese owners. It was because they were Canadians in this argument that they were owed responsible custodial care. And in the case of perishable property, as the, real, as the fishing vessels had been deemed earlier and grocery stock, that custodial care meant rapid liquidation. These arguments flew in the face of reality. There was plenty of evidence that would, might have pressed someone to think differently about this situation. First, only a tiny proportion of properties were ever deemed unsuitable by the municipal government. They may be boarded up, it's difficult to know for sure, but may be boarded up and condemned some two dozen uh, properties. Right? 1,700 properties were liquidated. The vast majority of the liquidated real estate was outside of the Powell Street neighborhood anyway. Only about 400 properties were in the Powell Street neighborhood. And the memo trail is very interesting on this. As, as the memos move up from McPherson through the office of the custodian, they keep on expanding in scope. You know, uh, the, 
the problem of the Powell Street uh, properties suggests that perhaps they should be liquidated. Memo carries on to the desk of another uh, uh, officer, the custodian. Uh, the problems of the Powell Street area suggest that Vancouver real estate should be liquidated. The problems of the Powell Street area suggest that Vancouver and suburban real estate should be um, uh, liquidated. The problem of the Powell Street area suggests that the BC real estate should be liquidated. And even in the Powell Street area itself, as the records of the custodians show, the vast majority of properties, some 80%, were rented and revenue-bearing. They weren't, in fact, tending to depreciate in value over time. Real estate companies were managing them at a, uh, at a profit, or at least uh, breaking even. However, the argument had power. It had plausibility. Officials could readily imagine that all Japanese Canadian property comprised a deteriorating slum because of how they understood race and how they understood the city. Beginning in walking tours in Vancouver's East End, these arguments found their way to the desk of the Secretary of State and then on to cabinet members. On January 11, 1943, when cabinet ministers sat to discuss the question of Japanese property, they began their discussion with the Powell Street neighborhood, and they ended their discussion with a draft of the liquidation order. I don't have time here to get into the question of rural properties, which have been more of a focus in existing discussions of this topic. But uh, in effect, rural properties uh, merited less discussion in these policy documents. And to the extent that they were discussed, the arguments there tended to converge with those around urban properties Ultimately, rural properties also were deemed perishable in nature. And together, these ideas motivated policy. On January 11, 1943, then, Norman McClarty, the Secretary of State, Ian McKenzie, the Minister of Pensions and Health, who's been often uh, central to the discussion of this topic, T.A. Kurar, Minister of Mines and Resources, and Humphrey Mitchell, the Minister of Labor, met to discuss the property question. They agreed quickly on the, on the principle of liquidation and then drafted the order in Council 469, which stated, wherever the custodian has been vested with the power and responsibility of controlling and managing any property of persons of the Japanese race, such power and responsibility shall be deemed to include and to have included from the date of the vesting of such property the power to liquidate, sell, or otherwise dispose of such property. Hence, that early mandate to protect and preserve Japanese Canadian real estate was written out of history. Two months later, the liquidation began. Historians and observers of this period will learn most from these events by thinking of the liquidation policy as an illustration of the process by which ideologies interweave. The liquidation was policy change. It represented a shift from the original mandate of the uh, custodian of enemy property during the Second World War, and it ran against the organization of that office. Such change required rationalization. To this end, bureaucrats devoted significant energy to analyses of the problems of urban neighborhood. They placed such claims at the forefront of their often private communications that preceded the liquidation order. The first body to recommend the liquidation of Japanese Canadian properties in Vancouver was the Town Planning Commission, for which the elimination of slums was of existential importance. Planners achieved unprecedented power in wartime Vancouver, although their plans for the area were ultimately thwarted. But they achieved this power because their ideas became enmeshed with the racism of the, of the uprooting. A local mandate to clear slums, interwove with the federal process already underway, stripping citizens of rights that should have been accorded them. Both influences, that local influence and federal, were necessary to the liquidation policy. McPherson, Buscombe, McKenzie, and others involved in the liquidation were racist. And the liquidation is an example of Canadian racism. In this case, Racial ideology was made powerful in combination with other ideas. In the winter of 1942 and 1943, racism found expression in the form of a liquidation policy 
because it intersected with other deeply held conceptions of the world. It was racialized uses of the city, rather than racial traits alone, that provided the impetus and the rationale for the liquidation policy. In the minds of bureaucrats and politicians, the ills of Japanese Canadian neighborhoods and the requirements of white residents offer justification for the violation of rights that ought to have been accorded to property owners on the coast of British Columbia. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. We uh, have time for questions, probably 15, 20 minutes. So, uh, in car for a moment. <laughs> Great. Um, what happened to the proceeds of the sale? Uh, were they held in escrow for the original owners? And were this, what was the um, was the market depressed at the time? Were they were the were they fire sale prices of the property they sold for? Yeah. Uh, great question. Thanks, Greg. Um, so. What happened with the funds depended on essentially the economic status of the owners initially. So after the after some sort of contemplation of this issue, the custodian resolved to send funds to those people who were self-supporting despite the disruption of the uproot. Um, the sales have been and the value of those sales have been subject of a couple of different inquiries into this topic. Immediately after the war, the Bird Commission decides that the worst devaluations in sale were the sales internal to the federal government for soldier settlement in rural areas. So there were bulk sales of hundreds of properties uh, for the purposes of uh, post-war soldier settlement. Those were seen by the Byrd Commission, which concluded its work in the early 50s, to have been massively depreciated in the sales. Uh, uh, Byrd himself, um, uh, uh, or, or that commission argues that the city properties were only marginally um, uh, sold at marginally uh, uh, below market values, and so some small amount of compensation is that. Price Waterhouse, in the context of the redress uh, that came in the 80s, examined this question again and found that the Bird Commission had underestimated those uh, economic damages uh, on the properties themselves, but also in other ways. They, they for instance, uh, Price Waterhouse looked at the eight wages that if uh, Japanese Canadians had remained in their occupations for the duration of the war, uh, their wages as against what could be calculated as their earnings during the war itself. And, and that actually was a larger part of the damages that the Price Waterhouse uh, study found. I'm actually doing analysis of these transactions also. And so I've taken a sample of. Um, 50 properties from the East End that were sold through this process of vestiture in the uh, custodian, and I'm seeking to expand that. And I've taken 50 properties that sold between 1942 and 1950, not through that process, but just as regular uh, market sales uh, in the East End of Vancouver. And I'm still analyzing uh, that data, but I think the story in the East End itself uh, will ultimately not be one of very significant discrepancies between those market sales and the vestiture sales, either in terms of who bought them, what they were doing with the properties, or the, um, or the prices. So uh, I don't think we'll find, uh, for instance, one of the questions I had going into that real estate research was, well, was there a speculative market? Could people buy low from the custodian and flip the property for a profit? I think even in early analysis of the data in Vancouver, that may have been true elsewhere. I haven't looked at these detailed property records elsewhere. But in Vancouver, that wasn't the case. People tended to buy and hold their properties for just as long as other buyers on the market and so on. So there wasn't this opportunity to jump in. If I had to lay a finger on who had uh, um, really to gain financially in this process, my, I think it's the real estate companies that were offering those dismal tours of the, uh, of the neighborhood. Uh, they were very actively seeking to be involved in, repres in exclusively representing those properties on the market. And some major companies that still exist, Hammerton, uh, among others, were um, leading uh, companies in representing those properties on the market and managing before they were sold. So I think there was real gain for real estate agents here. Yeah. What did happen to the neighborhood after liquidation? 
Well, that's another complicated question as well. One of the things that quite interests me, there's a peculiarity in the liquidation process where certain associational buildings, including the language school that was on Alexander, the uh, custodian writes to the board of that organization asking them to liquidate. Uh, and I'm not sure why they ask. Right? They're not asking anybody else. These are forced sales. I'm not sure why it is that they decide that they need to ask the language school whether they'll sell. And uh, the language school refused to sell. And they actually write back through their lawyers, they have lawyers in Vancouver, they write back and say, we won't sell for any price. There's no price for which we'll sell this school. And the print, former principal of that school returns to Vancouver in 1949 to resume work there uh, in the former uh, uh, Japanese neighborhood. So that story of um, certain people who had strong attachments to the neighborhood and wanted to preserve a Japanese uh, Canadian presence there is a really interesting one that I'm hoping to develop in the, in, in the future. The wider history of the neighborhood uh, is complex. And you know, I first came to this uh, project uh, with an interest in the sort of earlier history of the downtown east side. And I first started looking at this, um, at the liquidation in the context of, um, of, the, of, the long, of the concentration of poverty in the east end of the city. So one early question I have that I'm not still examining is, you know, did, could there be some causal role attributed here to the liquidation process? I think that that's um, you know, a complicated question that could probably be answered in various ways, but not one that I'm, not one that I'm right now seeking to seeking to answer. Yeah. yeah? You are a, a historian, so you are studying for the purposes of understanding all the historical references and, and so on. What does your heart tell you would have been a better response, or what, what do we learn today so that history doesn't repeat itself? Uh, I'm not as prone to enjoying history for history's sake, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed this, by the way. Uh, <laughs> for all that. Not for its own sake. Sorry, but yeah, I, yeah, I don't want to admit it. But uh, from a 2012 perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's an important question to me. Uh, I, I think of my, I'm, I tend to study, I studied Philadelphia and Toronto when I was kind of Philadelphia and Toronto, I've started to study the West Coast, being out here, I'm concerned about places where I am, and sort of have um, research questions motivated out of, uh, that, uh, out of that environment that I'm living in. Um, so I have questions, in effect, about what happened to race in mid-century Canada, and those questions stretch to the present. You know, uh, what happened to what kinds of changes, what kinds of continuities existed in the way in which Canadians have approached diversity and racial diversity in particular. Uh, and this kind of language that um, carries out what is clearly a racialized and I would say racist mission, but that acknowledges, uh, but th that, can, that can dress itself, and not only dress itself, but I think um, in some regards the people writing this believed what they were writing, that these were important ideas for them, that it was important to discover that, that in fact the slum was deteriorating. And then those kinds of ideas about the East End, for example, in the Chinese neighborhood, which there were, uh, which was, you know, there were liquidation plans for it in the post-war. Uh, in, in the late 40s, Leonard Marsh, uh, who was at UBC, also was writing a study um, advocating essentially the clearance of slums in the East End as well. And uh, it's, it's just after the war, and he writes positive things about racial diversity. So he says, you know, there, 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 there's a uh, miniature uh, League of Nations, a miniature United Nations in the East End, uh, but its slum characteristics mandate its, um, mandate its uh, uh, liquidation anyway, essentially, from Marsh. Um, and yet the... Um, residents of that area are able to mobilize, and in some regards, I think, to use their citizenship to combat that um, effort to liquidate the neighborhood at that time, to liquidate their residences, although there is some liquidation that occurs, or expropriation. 
So I think there are complicated things going on here with regards to this emerging of race, ideas that uh, persist and others that disappear, um, that, that, that have bearing on how, uh, on how we continue to talk about cities, how we continue to talk about immigrants, um, uh, how we continue to talk about racial diversity in Canada. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. John, here. Thanks, Jordan. This is a great talk, and it's a fascinating and disturbing um, uh, example of historical contingency and um, I think unintended consequences. Uh, when, as you point out, when the internment was uh, orders were given, uh, liquidation wasn't part of the strategy. And uh, for the city council uh, and the planning department, you know, they wanted slum clearance and redevelopment, which didn't happen ultimately. I guess is what yeah. they told us. So. Um, uh, I'm, I'm interested uh, what happens to the neighborhood. Uh, uh, I mean, it's there, it's the city council and planning committee um, intervention that, that you say triggers liquidation. They want clearance. In the end, I think uh, an earlier talk you, you mentioned sometimes it was in fact Chinese uh, uh, who moved from, if you like, Chinatown and buy these properties and stays, if you like, an Asian and poor neighborhood mm -hmm. afterwards. Um, how, did, how does a city planners then respond to this, if you like, frustrated vision? Of yeah. So there is this effort to, uh, to use other reasoning, although in many ways continuous reasoning, to, to clear the neighborhood afterward. The frustration of the plan itself is really interesting, I think. It's, 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 it's um, you know, I think it's an example of how powerful this imaginary of Japanese neighborhood was that it took very late in the game, as late as 1944, they're still thinking that they're going to clear, uh, they're negotiating secretly with CPR to try and run tracks through there and to establish industry there. Uh, there's some promise on that front. Um, they're still talking about workers' housing to an extent, although less so it becomes more kind of industrial vision. And they suddenly realize in 1944 that they don't own all the property. That, in fact, ownership in the um, the Japanese Canadian neighborhood had always been diverse. That they own that, you know, that the, they own maybe half of each block. They don't actually own a contiguous. They're not. They haven't invested with a contiguous area of the city that could be cleared. There's hundreds of other owners there, of all kinds of merchants: Jewish owners, Chinese owners, uh, um, Italian owners, British owners. Right. Um, the residential population on Powell Street, at least, was, was almost exclusively Japanese. And so maybe those walking tours, when you walked through an uh, area that had been totally, uh, its residents had been totally eliminated, you could well imagine, oh, now we've invested with this whole neighborhood and we can do with it what we please. But they map it in 44. I wish I could see the map, although I've recreated the map. But they map it in 44, and they realize that they don't have what they think they have. And so all of those plans essentially are abandoned. It's so impossible to, it would take a huge investment to then uh, liquidate that neighborhood. Um, so, it's, so it is this story of policy failure. The, 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 their initiative succeeds in doing probably um, what would have been, you know, it was of interest to Alderman Buscombe to remove the Japanese Canadian population. But I think broadly for someone like Frank Buck, I don't think that was his, his game at all. It succeeds in doing something that really had very little to do with what its initial uh, uh, interest was and doesn't succeed and didn't uh, uh, what it intended. And Buck had assigned the Japanese gardens in the UBC as well? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm curious to see what comes of kind of roping Buck into this history, whether anything will come of it. I don't know whether you'll be seeing this on Is there anything from the short side of the room? <laughs> Friends and family? Yeah, I, was, I was wondering, um, so, you know, slum clearance and that whole uh, discourse on clearance plays a major role here. Um, and that was going on not just in Vancouver, but across North America and in different cities. Um, so this is a story, uh, maybe this is a bit extreme with the kind of internment camps, but, you know, residents, particularly racial minorities, being kind of stripped of their land and being sent to the projects and, and other kind of public housing and things. Yeah. It's a common story in different cities, right? So it speaks to issues beyond Vancouver as well yeah. during that period. Yeah, and I want to develop that international side. It's also kind of the Canadian national side. It's always been thought that Toronto was sort of the first place where you had a major uh, clearance uh, with the Regent Park project there. 
uh, just shortly after this period. Um, but Vancouver maybe emerges as an early player in the story. In the States, even, there's been relatively little action by 42 in this direction, right? So they really get out on the forefront. Buck's clearly in conversation with transnational networks of planners and, it, and push it. And they had this moment of kind of pushing to the forefront of this movement. And then, uh, as we were suggesting, it, doesn't, it sort of only gets halfway there. Uh, but that connection is one that I'm really interested in. Maybe even though I'm supposed to be chairing this, I can ask a question. Was there any communication at the wall with the actual owners of these properties who have been deported? Yeah. And the sub question is was any distinction made between homeowners and people who were in rental properties? Who were who had rental properties and in the thinking? You mean resident owners versus or you mean uh, yeah, tenants? Yeah, I, I mean people who, who lived in their own houses and right. were right. deported. Um, the first question, so, um, and this is a, uh, an issue I want to deal with in a separate section of the manuscript. Certainly, uh, Japanese Canadians sought to speak back to this policy from their settlement camps. And they launched a legal challenge through a lawyer uh, firm that had been involved with Japanese Canadian clients. Really interesting firm. Uh, where this lawyer is writing to, to Japanese Canadians before entering the war, kind of urging them to uh, respond to racist material in the newspapers and stuff. So really kind of an anti-racist uh, lawyer, I think. And, um, and they launched through this firm a legal challenge that goes to a federal court that then existed, the Exchequer Court. Uh, on, and they used three test properties to try and challenge um, the liquidation. They also, uh, that uh, court case, Kind of winds its way essentially through the what the processes of the Exchequer Court, and it's ultimately decided that it's um, a jurisdictional error that it couldn't come before the Exchequer Court. That decision by the judge is rendered in '47 once all the properties already been liquidated. The um, uh, they also, uh, for example, pressured these um, uh, Japanese Canadian representatives on those advisory committees. So the committee that I'm most interested in. Um, the Vancouver Committee uh, had a member, uh, Kichizo Kimura, who uh, resigned from the committee uh, basically on the day that the properties actually went to market. Under pressure, he said, from uh, Japanese Canadian property owners and their associations in the camps. And he wrote a lengthy memoir uh, in Japanese of his experience. He was also on the Fishing Vessels Committee. He wrote a lengthy memoir of his participation in that committee as well as his participation in the uh, uh, Properties Liquidation Committee that's never really uh, uh, been examined. And we're uh, just now, with the help of a graduate student, translating that to English and uh, trying, to work with, um, trying to work with that source. So there are a variety of responses uh, here. And then the, there are actions within the Bird Commission. There are actions within the Redress Movement are also, of course, uh, responses of Japanese Canadians to this process. The only instances of communication going the other way that I've um, observed are, on the one hand, these letters to the school suggesting that they agree to uh, liquidate, which are confusing letters to me. Uh, and, of course, their appointment of those representatives on the advisory committees. And, and, and that's kind of, uh, I'm sure, um, uh, the, uh, Kimura's own explanation of his service on those committees is interesting and complicated and, and merits analysis. But from the custodian's perspective, it's clearly a blatant example of token. It's just sort of such a bald example of tokenism. They keep reiterating in subsequent documents we had a Japanese member on the committee who, you know, and they had the opportunity to, to so they, they returned to that over and, and over again. So that was certainly uh, uh, a concern for them. Uh, but those two instances, aside from those representatives and the letters to the associations, are the only examples of communication. They, they make effort, for example, um, there are various other uh, kind of administrative efforts, you know, dealing with. Uh, creditors on one another's properties and so on. They don't have staff to communicate with Japanese language speakers, and that's one of the early problems they confront. They're trying to find out what property has been vested in them, and they can't communicate Japanese. Um, your second question, no. I never saw any kind of a distinction between, say, rental or business properties and, uh, and uh, 
resident owners in terms of their treatment of so uh, just these just this associational right. thing. Yeah. I so this yeah. is a possibly easy question because I just I don't know. It just uh, but I don't. That's going to be a really hard question. No, it's not. <laughs> it's really not. It's just, it's so it shows a huge gap in my knowledge, and I, I hesitate about even asking of it. I don't understand why in 1942 they just couldn't be explicitly racist because I thought all the sensitivity towards that came after the war and actually more into 48, 49, 50. And so in 42, when people, these people who are overtly racist according to some of the documents didn't feel at liberty to just say, you know, this yeah. is what the unassimil unassimilable, that's it, let's go. Yeah. Uh, I just find that really surprising. Yeah. I wonder if you could comment on yeah. that. Yeah, and uh, there's one document in particular where I saw that, uh, you know, this is really uh, interestingly displayed. So you have this highly technical document where, for example, they're talking about, uh, just as an example, um, properties where the capital repairs to the property would exceed 30% of the value of the property should, according to some city bylaw, be demolished rather than improved. This is kind of one of the aspects of policy that they're working through. And so it's kind of, that's the nature of the arguments they're making in the document. And then as an aside, right at the end of an 11-page memo or something, the author of it is a kind of an administrator in the office says, and incidentally, McPherson and I were talking, and we both agreed, you know, if we had just deported all of the Japanese from the outset to a, plate, a, to a warm climate. So he's talking about <laughs> deporting the entire Japanese population out of Canada, it would seem. From, if we had cooperated with the United States to deport them to a warm climate, all of these problems would have been solved from another junction. So, you know, in these private documents, why are they, I mean, they do express those views towards the end, but none of that has to do with how they're rationalizing the um, uh, the policy itself. They're instead using this really technical language. They're clearly concerned in some of the rural uh, memos surrounding rural properties um, make clear they are concerned about liability. So they are concerned that these are Canadian citizens. The custodian has never, until the case of the Japanese, dealt with Canadian citizens or with this notion of protecting and preserving property. And, and they are concerned that um, there's, the rural properties are assessed very early in the uh, process by a soldier settlement board, even before the custodian can get in, because the Japanese owners are still running their farms, and the uh, soldier settlement board starts assessing them. And the custodian uh, becomes concerned that these early assessments, while the farms were still operative, will generate claims that, as Canadian citizens, the owners will be able to make against them after uh, after the sale because they they say that the the new the tenant farmers aren't nearly as good as the Japanese uh, uh, Canadian farmers have been and the farms are deteriorating and so those assessments that were made while they were still operative farms by the owners you know they won't be able to fetch those prices after they've been kind of trashed by the tenants for a few years right so, and they, they clearly state that in terms of liability. Um, and in one instance, in the custodian's office, again, um, there's a, uh, a memo uh, internal to the custodian when this court, uh, a court appeal is launched at the Exchequer's Court. Someone, some legal counsel, says something to the effect, I think the case might have merit, you know, should we be worried about this? And he gets told by his, you know, a superior, yeah, for, you know, forget about it, that, you know, that we don't have to worry about that case, essentially. So I think there was some concern um, that citizenship, they're using that term, even though there's not a citizenship act yet, that citizenship is going to mean something, that it's going to mean something uh, legally, uh, that there's going to be uh, liability, and that therefore the policy needs some kind of alternative uh, justification. At the very same time, the city council, like I said, is passing resolutions that say, literally, the Japanese are an unassimilable race and therefore should be deported from Canada. So you definitely still, it's still quite available to, to say those kinds of things in uh, public in Canada at that time, but this is a, a, an area where we're starting to see some shift. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I think we're going to have to bring it to a close at, at this point because we have to evacuate. But uh, on behalf of everyone, I'd really like to thank Jordan 
not only for his talk, but for all his efforts in organizing this entire series.